Okay. So, so until last time we learned about basic probabilistic method. <coughs> then in the remaining two lectures, we will learn some examples in extremal graph theory. So let's consider the following question. How many edges guarantee the triangle? I mean, how many edges in, say, on n vertex graph? This is same as asking how many can a graph, the n vertex graph, with no triangle have? So what's the maximum number of edges in an n vertex graph without any triangle? What is the maximum such number of edges? <coughs> so, I mean, if we are asked such a question, first thing to try is that uh, is there any some easy example which has lots of edges but having no triangle? So one of the possible thing, I mean, example is you consider bipartite graph. Then bipartite graph obviously has no triangle. And among bipartite graph, which one has the maximum number of edges? Complete bipartite graph. And among complete bipartite graph, which one has a maximum number of edges? If both sides has a, I mean, size as close as possible. So we consider case, I mean, n over two, one is ceiling, one is floor. So balanced complete bipartite graph. If n is even, then we put the same number of vertices. If n is odd, then it's one off. Then <coughs> this has number of edges, floor of n square over four. And this clearly does not have a triangle. You have a complete bipartite graph. No matter how you take three vertices, two of them belong to the same part. So you don't have a triangle. Then, I mean, would it be best possible? In other words, if we have a one more vertex, one more edges, sorry, does it force uh, A3? So, to deal with uh, this kind of natural problem, let's define some terminology. So we write x, e, x, n, f for a given graph f, be the number of edges in an n vertex graph not containing this f as a subgraph. So, an above question is, can be rephrased that uh, what is extreme number of n, k3. And let's give some names on this balanced bipartite graph or very balanced r partite graph in general. So let's say t sub r n be the balanced complete r partite graph. With n vertices. And we read small t sub r n. Let's give some color. 
see the number of axes in such graph. So actually this kind of question was asked by Turan and then he proved some theorem regarding this extremal number of complete graph. So we call this as a either extremal number or Turan number of the graph f. So ex and f is called the extremal number. or the Turan number. So if, I mean, with this definition, if we have a one more edge than this, then we always have to have a, I mean, F as a subgraph. <clears throat> so actually, we can show that this is best possible, meaning that the extremal number of n k3 is floor of n square over 4. And the only graph which does not contain k3 and that has this many edges is this t2, t2n, the complete bipartite graph. And yeah, as soon as we have one more edge, we must have a triangle. <clears throat> we will prove this. And this is exactly T sub 2n. Then what would be the T sub rn? Mm, let's say r plus 1. Let's write r plus 1. But what if we consider the extremal number of complete graph on R plus one vertices? We can actually show that this is same as a T sub Rn. One of the easy way to construct a graph containing no click of size R plus one is you can you take the R part type graph. And then to add as many edges as possible, you add, you make it bipartite. I mean, you make it complete, and then also it make it balanced to maximize the number of edges. And in here, no matter how you choose r plus one vertices, two of them belong to the same part, and there are no edges between. So it doesn't contain case of r plus one. So such number of edges is actually also maximum possible number of edges in a case of r plus one free graph. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, Turan theorem, so Turan in, I mean, in 40s, I don't exactly, I didn't write it down here. I don't exactly remember when he proved it, but he was actually in a, I mean, he was a Jewish and then he was in the labor camp of the, I mean, Nazi at the time. Wait, was it Jewish? I'm slightly confused. Anyway, he was, uh, I mean, in a labor camp. And then in labor camp, I mean, it's difficult to do mathematics. So you don't have, a, I mean, paper or pen. So he kind of, I mean, do mathematics just with his mind only. Without writing down, he just imagined things. And then at that time, he proved this theorem. <clears throat> so any k sub r plus 1 free. So any graph with containing no k sub r plus 1 as a subgraph. And vertex graph contains at most t sub r and edges and the equality holds 
only for this complete R type balanced graph, balanced complete R type graph. So this is the only graph with the maximum number of edges among all k sub i plus one prefect. <clears throat> so in order to prove this, we use the following, I mean, we prove the following theorem of Kero and Wei. So theorem is Haro 79, Wei 81, prove that the following. So n and r be some number satisfying this condition. And any n vertex graph G with not too many edges. satisfies uh, contains an independent set of size r plus one. So what we want to do is that uh, we want to say flip edges and non-edges. So here, if we flip this non-edges and non-edges here, then the complete subgraph on r plus one vertices becomes independent set of size r plus one, right? Flip edges and non edges and then take the contrapositive. Then what does it become? Maybe we move this a bit below. So this shows that uh, if you take the contrapositive, then more than this many edges forces a copy of case of r plus one. And then if you flip the edges and non-edges, then the less than n choose two minus t sub r minus n edges implies an independent set, at least r plus one. So this statement and this statement are equivalent. So if we prove this, then we are done. And here, what's this number? This number is number of non-edges in case of R, I mean, complete balanced R pi type graph. So if you just compute the number of pairs in here, then if N is this number, then what do you know? Here, R plus one, this size is R plus one or R, each part in here. If we know this, no, sorry, Q plus one or Q. And then how many Q plus one? K many and R minus K many Q. So number of non-edges here, I mean, is this number. And this number is exactly K times Q1 choose two plus R minus K times Q choose two. So if we want to prove this, then if we prove this, then we prove the trans theorem. And this is exactly what this Caraway say, Caraway theorem says. The original proof of Turan, I mean, there are many proof of Turan theorem. So I'm going to introduce this, I mean, theorem, I mean, this proof using probability method. So let's do this. So let M be the number of wedges. G. And then what we want to do is we want to <coughs> choose some random independent set. But uh, choosing random independent set is actually quite non-trivial task. If we already know all the independent set and you choose one of them uniformly random, then that's one good way. But uh, we the problem is we don't know the list of independent sets. If we already know the list of independent sets, then we don't need to 
use the probability method. We are already done. That's what I mean. We want to prove a size. So we want to devise some random algorithm which spits out an independent set. We don't know the how, I mean, what distribution it has. I mean, some independent set are more likely to come out, and some independence could be less likely to, to come out. But we want to devise some way to find an independent set in a random way. And here is one such way. So what we do is we choose on ordering, say, sigma of the older vertices in G uniformly and random. Meaning that uh, there are n factorial possible ordering of vertices. You choose one of them with a probability one over n factorial exactly. So you choose one of them uniformly random. Now what we do? After this, in this ordering, we choose on ordering. No, we choose, uh, I mean, maybe we let, let u of sigma be the set of all vertices, which comes before or its neighbor. So what it means is that uh, if you have uh, some vertices and then say this is P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6 in this ordering, and there are some edges here. Here, P1 is in this U because its neighbor is two and four, and two, four are all after one. And two is not in U because two has a neighbor one, three, six, but one is before two. So two is not before all its neighbor. And three has two, two neighbors, two and five. So two is before three, so three is not in there. Four has one, four is not in there. Five is not in there, six is not in there. So in this case, I mean, this is the only vertex. So this may not be a good example, but uh, if you take, uh, say, same graph, but uh, if you take the ordering in a way that uh, this is P1, this is P2, this is P3, P4, P5, maybe let's say this is P3, P4, six and this is in u and this is also in u all of which neighbor have a r after two and this is also in u because it's before all of its neighbor which is five or and six and these three are not so with a different ordering you get different set <coughs> then what we know is then this u sigma is on independent set in G. Because what do we know? If we have a uh, two vertices, VI and VJ are both in U, and then if there is an edge, then whichever one bigger, I and J, let's say J is bigger, then this cannot be in U because it has neighbor which comes before, which is a contradiction. So you cannot contain two adjacent vertices. So U is a independent set. So let X be the random variable such that X comes from this sigma, so random ordering. So if you choose it, then X value is determined and it's size of this U. Then what we have? 
we have that this x is the summation of all indicator random variable IP, where for each vertex in PG, IV is, I mean, it comes, it's determined by sigma. It's either one if V is in U, zero if it is not in U. And what do we know? Since the ordering is chosen uniformly random, we can actually analyze the probability that such specific vertex is in U. The probability that V appears before all of its neighbor is you get rid of the probability that i v is one is one over degree of v plus one because we have v and its neighbor let's say three of them then out of these four vertices we have to check the probability that this comes before all three but the, there are m factorial ordering out of them how to put this four and then how to put remaining one are i mean you can analyze <coughs> so how do we choose this so out of n you choose four position <coughs> and in the remaining position you put them in an arbitrary way and out of these four you have to choose this first and then the later so which is three factorial and this is exactly one over four you can compute <coughs> yeah so in the same way you can show that this priority is one over degree plus one then by using the linearity of expectation how you can compute the expectation of this x, which is you just, for indicator random variable, expectation is same as probability that it's one. So this is what we have. Then what do we know? This is the summation of a uh, reciprocal of this number. But what do we know? This expression have a fixed sum. If we take the all degree plus one and then add up together, then by handshake lemma, this is two times number of edges of G plus N, <coughs> which is two N plus N. M is already fixed. So we fixed the graph at the beginning. So this is fixed. And then this is the summation of uh, the fraction. Then the final expression above is minimized when the decrease of vertices in U of G are as even as possible. So this expression is minimized when all the degrees are as even as possible with a fixed sum. Because I mean, you can easily say the one over five, one over five is minimized is, I mean, this is smaller than or equal to eight, one over eight, one over two, when sum is 10. Or other, or other words, I mean, this one over X 
function is, I mean, satisfying uh, con convex. This is a convex function, so. You can show this. Then, what do we have? I mean, here the degrees are not just real number. It's a, uh, it's a integer. So this two times what the above expression. We know that this happens, and this left one is a uh, sum of r minus k q terms of q and k times k q plus one terms of q plus one of total n terms. So what do we know? And then n is strictly smaller than, uh, 2n plus 1 is strictly smaller than this. So that this expression is strictly bigger than this many term of 1 over q plus this many term of 1 over q plus 1 is r. So what did we show? We show that the expectation of x is strictly bigger than r. So this implies <coughs> that there exists an ordering because I mean there must be a choice which does better than the expectation, better than or equal to the expectation, such that this u of sigma has size strictly bigger than r because expectation is strictly bigger so it has to be say at least expectation of x which is strictly bigger than r but this is a uh, integer so meaning that g contains an independent set of size type of one. <clears throat> so this proves Caraway theorem, and then it proves this part. And we can also prove the this part. The equality only holds for this graph. Then on other, in other words, in Caraway theorem, the inequality only holds for the complement, which is disjoint union or clique. So let's prove that. So again, maybe we can simply copy and paste this. So let G on n vertex graph with here equality and n its independence number is exactly r and g is the distant union of k we could have qn plus one union with r minus k, k sub q. Then what we know is that uh, for such a graph, again, we can prove, we can go as a wall, then this becomes expectation of x is 
again, I mean, summation of one over degree plus one is at least R. So now we have equality. So that means we don't have uh, inequality, we have equality. So we have inequality. That means you get R. So we have this inequality. But what do we know? On the other hand, as G has no independent set of size R plus one, we must have expectation and most R. Thus, we know that expectation is exactly R for such curve. And then this is equality. So, I mean, all the degrees must be as close as possible. So, and X has to be a constant random variable. Because if average is R, and then there is one number which is below R, then there must be also one number above R. Otherwise, you don't get the average R, right? Otherwise, there exists sigma such that x sigma is bigger than the expectation, a contradiction. So we know that if x is actually constant random variable. But now what we know, suppose that g is not a union of clicks. Then what do we know? If this is not union of clicks, if this is union of click, then, I mean, depending on, I mean, this adjacent relation forms an equivalent relation. If you belong to the same component, then you are adjacent. Okay, so technically equivalent relation has to be reflexive, but uh, it's not reflexive, but uh, you know what I mean? So if you belong to the two vertices belong to the component, then they must be, I mean, adjacent. So symmetricity and transitivity of the equivalent relation holds. But if that's not the case, then there is, there is a triple which shows this transitivity does not hold. There is, which means x, y, g with x, y and x, g are edges. But yg is not it. Again, if there is no such triple, then the adjacency is transitivity, transitive relation. So all the component must be click. Then it's this two union of click, which is uh, not what you want. So if G is not union of click, then there must be such triple. And what you do is we consider ordering sigma, which is x comma y comma g and dot dot dot, and sigma prime, which is y comma g comma x comma dot dot dot, in such a way that they are identical on all the vertices except the x, y, g, three vertices. Then this u sigma and u sigma prime are exactly the same. For other vertices, I mean, it's exactly the same. Because it's neighborhood, the relationship with the other vertices, whether which one is earlier, is exactly the same. And with this, again, I mean, if x, I mean, this relation was here, but the even if x is moved here, 
it doesn't change. X is still before this vertex. So they are same except the uh, three vertices. Except X is in U sigma and Y and G are not in U sigma because X is adjacent to, to both and X comes before. And X is not in U sigma prime, but Y, G are both in sigma U prime. Because y, g are not adjacent, and then they are all adjacent to x. And they are at the front. <clears throat> but what does this mean? Then u sigma prime is actually bigger than u sigma. So x is not constant. So this contradiction says that the G is the union of clicks. But uh, what we know, we show that this G, the degrees of G are as even as possible. We prove the proposition. So that uh, those click size have to be exactly as we wanted. <clears throat> this shows this determines exactly the extreme number of all clicks. Then what about other graph? And for other graph, we know the following theorem, which is Erdish Stone Simonovich theorem. Let F be a graph with formatting number I plus one. And for given delta, part arbitrary delta, and say. Okay, let's not use F, let's use H. So depending on this delta and H, we can choose N0 such that the following holds for all and at least N0. Which is extreme number of nh is at most one minus one over r plus delta times say n choose two. Let's write n square over two. So this is an uh, actually upper bound. And this actually uh so that means for whatever however small delta you can make. You can choose. I mean, if n is large enough, this is roughly one minus one over r times n squared over two is upper bound. And for lower bound, I mean, if h has a chromatic number r plus one, then h is not in this two round graph. So this is comp balance complete r type graph, which we also call two round graph. This it's not in this two round graph. Because this, any subgraph of this is R chromatic. I mean, has a chromatic number at most R because this is, is R part type. But uh, what do you know? If N of H is at least then number of H is in here, which is also roughly one minus one over R, say, I mean, if you do the, Let's say little one times n square over two. So n choose two. So 
So this means that uh, if you have uh, this upper bound and lower bound, that implies that uh, if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, then this extremal number, which is function of n divided by n to the two is actually one minus one over r. Again, I'm writing f and h of it. Yeah, in a confusing way. So. So if we know the extremal, I mean, the chromatic number of h, then we can predict this unit, this limit. So which kind of uh, asymptotically determines the extremal number of h, as long as h is not bipartite one. So if bipartite, if h is bipartite, this becomes zero because r is one. <coughs> In that case, I mean, we only know that the uh, such a function, extremal number, is subquadratic, but uh, it doesn't still give you an asymptotically how fast it grows. So for that, we will discuss later. But the, for non bipartite one, this kind of uh, determines asymptotic extremal number in a quite precise way. So let's prove this. So how do we want to prove this? We first this h, let's say, I mean, the number of vertices in h is h. Then what we know is this h is subgraph of k sub h, 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 r plus one partite, complete r plus one partite graph. It's a subgraph. So as long as if we find uh, this copy in a graph with more than this many edges, then we can we conclude that any graph with more than this many edges contains h. Then we get this inequality. So what we do is that uh, we want to show that. I mean, we can find uh, such a large, complete r plus one partite graph in your graph if you have a lot of edges. So let's prove this claim. Let's say R and H are I mean, either zero or <coughs> non-negative integer. And delta is positive. And there exists, say, N1, which is depending on R, H, delta, such that the following holds for all n bigger than n1. So if, say, g prime is an m vertex graph with delta g prime at least 1 minus 1 over r plus delta over 2 n, say. So if we have a minimum degree condition, then this G prime contains a complete R plus one partite graph with each part having size list H as a subgraph. We contain this complete r plus one partite graph as a sub if you have a minimum degree condition. So this is claim. So we want to show that if you have a number of edges, at least something, we want to find this. But this claim is slightly weaker. So if you have a lower bound on the maximum degree, then we can do. So let's prove this first. So what we do is we use induction on R. So roughly what we want to do is we want to find the large vertices and the large vertices with the, which forms a complete right partite graph and then some number of vertices. And by choosing this, we might shrink but the complete three partite one. And then you choose more vertices and we shrink 
and complete four part type and so on. We want to keep do this. So we want to use the induction on R. So for R equals zero, then clearly, I mean, if you have a Give me a moment. Yeah, if r equals zero, then what do we want to find? We want to find the one part type graph. So as long as you find h vertices, then we are done. So if we have a more than h vertices, then we are done. So if r equals zero, then we are done. So assume r at least one and we will show that and one r h delta is i mean the following expression would be sufficient for this so n1 r minus 1 t delta which would exist because we do induction on r and what's t where t is say 4h over delta and take Shilly. If we know that the theorem holds with r minus one, then we know the existence of this with uh, this choice. And then now we see that the, this would work for all rh delta here. So let n1 be Let's say yeah, n. This be n. Then what do we know? This one is bigger than this. So what you multiplied here is at least one. So induction hypothesis yields a complete. R part type graph with part type sets A1 to AR of size T. And let U be the all the remaining vertices. And what you do is that uh, you have A1, A2, A3, and then outside you have U. For well, here, there are some vertices which would be possible candidate for next set. For such a vertice, what do we have to have? So for each vertex, it has to have at least H neighbor, at least H neighbor, at least H neighbor, then later, if we choose some vertices, and then if it's here, then we it gives some possibility to actually shrink this so that the new graph is complete R part type, R plus one part type, because they are already complete. And then this has a in, in I mean has sent S to everything. If we choose some vertices, then this. I mean, those vertices are some possible vertices we can choose later. Well, then it's necessary that the this has at least H neighbors in all of them. So that U prime be such vertices in U such that uh, in each AI, it sends at least H edges for all of them. They be the set of vertices in U having at least H neighbors in each AI. Now what we want to do, we want to estimate the size of this U prime. We want to show that there are many choices 
which are good for us. So for that, what we do is we want to do some sort of double counting. And what do we double count? We want to double count the following. So let's say for each U, we let W be V1, V2, VR, U. So this is tuples of the vertices. So that the VI is a neighbor of this U in AI. So you count this. So meaning that uh, for this vertex, you choose one, choose one, choose one, then this tuple is counted. Then for this vertex, how many such tuple with uh, U here? This is the number of neighbors here, number of neighbors here, number of neighbors here, you multiply them. Then you see the occurrence of such tuple with the last coordinate U. And let W be all union of this U. Then what do we have? And this choice is, why do we count this choice? We want to distinguish the vertices, which has at least H, at least H, at least H, and some vertex which are not in U prime, meaning that it sends less than H in one of them. And this is one of the way to distinguish those two. Because if we have a vertex which is outside of this U prime, then what do we have? We have this WU is smaller than H times T times T times T, H times T to the R minus one. So if U is outside of U prime, then it sends less than H to one of them, at least one of them. And then remaining one could be, for all we know, it could be completely, I mean, it has completely all neighbors, which is T. Then R minus one T and then one H, if you multiply them together, then it's still strictly smaller than this. So you have some upper bound in here. <coughs> then what does it mean? It implies that uh, the size of W is at least for all U prime, it's maximum T to the R. And for all vertices not in U prime, it's at most H times T to the R minus one. So this is at most this and most this. Then you get this. So we don't know, we, are, we want to estimate this. And the worst case, this is at most N. So you have this upper bound on W. On the other hand, we also have a lower bound on this W. How? Now, what did you do? We count this in terms of, in the, in the view of this coordinate. Now for view of this coordinate, we count. So for every, we want to say VR in A1 to AR tuple. What do we have? We have that by our minimum degree condition, the common neighbor of this. So you have a V1, V2, V3. You consider the common neighbor. Then what? This is exactly N minus all non-neighbor. So if it's a non-neighbor of one of them, then you kick out. So some, for some vertices, it's not adjacent to one of them, then it's, it's never in here. So we kick out, we kick out, we kick out. And this is obviously lower bound. <coughs> then what do we know? By our minimum degree condition, we know that uh, each set has size at least this one. So it's non neighbor size is, I mean, the M minus one minus this. So you can actually put one over R plus delta over two N. Then you can see that the, sorry, this is minus 
you can see that this is at least r delta n over two. So what do we know? From here, w is at least for all v1 to vr, a1 to a r, you add up this number, then the choice is t to the r, so r t to the r delta n over two. So this is lower bound on w. Then we have this and this. What do we have? I mean, this is u prime, sorry. Then from that, we can actually show that uh, this u prime is at least r delta n over four. That's, I mean, from our choice. So here and here, and because we choose T also here, <coughs> so we have this. So now we have lower bound on this U prime. So what we now we can do is that uh, for each this U prime, we know that the, here it has a, this H, this H, this H vertices. So that the later, if we choose U prime, then we can shrink this to smaller set. But the problem is for different vertices, it might have a different neighbor. Then our goal is if we can find the many vertices here, which has exactly the same H vertices, which are all adjacent, then we can just take those H vertices and then here also H vertices, then that give us what we want. So now let's show, we, we can do that because U prime is so large. So what we do for each U in U prime, we consider a tuple, say FU, which is set of vertices depending on this U, such that this BIU is a uh, all neighbor of U in AI, and they have size exactly H for each I in R. Then but what we know by pigeon or principle, because U is large, there exists a tuple, say V1, sorry, to VR, and each one of them has size H. such that the F inverse of this, meaning that the, the vertex is U in U prime, which has F value is actually this tuple. Is at least size of u prime over t choose h to the r. This is possible value of f, right, in here. So by pigeon principle, this exists, but what does it, what is it? So this is r delta n over four times one over t choose r, t choose h to the r, but What's this? So this n is bigger than n1. And our choice is this, right? Here we have t times t choose r, t choose h. So t choose h to the r. So you delete that and you get t n1. So this, this, and then t. What was the definition of t? And yeah, R 
born and t was the defined to be say fall h over delta so that takes care of delta and fall then you get the this is early stage so the the such choice was to make this inequality so this is coming from definition of n hence what do we have so p1 so such p1 p2 pr f inverse of p1 to pr together form a complete r part r plus one part type graph with each part having size at least h. So this proves the claim. So now we prove the theorem. One thing we can prove is that uh, if E of G is at least say one minus R plus delta over two and square over two edges, then there exists a subgraph G prime of G with number of vertices, say n prime is at least say delta n over four, and minimum degree is at least one minus one over r plus delta over two. N prime. So this is not too difficult to prove. So you can actually try to prove it yourself. So basically what you do is that uh, if you have a graph G and then if minimum degree condition does not satisfy, if, I mean, G satisfy it with uh, N, N and N prime same, and then if this is true, then we are happy. Sorry, this is Delta and Delta over two here. So that's also important. Then we are done, right? In that case, if G self satisfies the minimum degree condition, we are done. Otherwise, you choose the vertex whose degree is too low and then delete it. And then new graph, you analyze again. And then if that's what you want, you are good. Otherwise, you delete a small, I mean, small vertex, I mean, vertex with a small degree. And you, we keep doing that. And then we can get the contradiction if the number of remaining edges is too small. That contradiction kind of comes from these two gap. Every time you delete the edge, edge delete the vertex, we only delete it if its degree is quite less than every degree, not just a bit less, but because of this gap, this is actually a bit less than every degree. So by deleting this, your entire every degree kind of, uh, I mean, goes up. So by keep deleting it, it's actually impossible to delete all vertices. So you have to stop at some point before, I mean, this many vertices are left. So it's not too, too difficult. So you can try to prove it yourself. So we let the N zero be the four, say delta inverse N one R H delta S we prove this N1 is in this claim, then G contains a subgraph G prime with at least N1 vertices and 
the n prime voltage this with the n prime bigger than or equal to this and minimum degree condition is met and apply claim above claim to g prime then it contains uh, h which is a subset of this complete subgraph of this complete i plus one pi type graph and then we slide in g and we slide in g prime which is right within g so this proves the theorem so Yeah, maybe in next lecture, we make it quite short. I mean, so today what we prove is we learned about this extremal number of a graph. So what is extremal number? Extremal number or Turan number is the maximum number of edges in an M vertex graph, which does not contain this graph as a subgraph. So this is actually a function on n, but we say this is an extremal number or Turan number. And then today we prove the Turan theorem, which determines the extremal number of complete graphs. And also we prove this Erdős Stone Simonovich theorem. Which asymptotically determines extremal number. I mean up to some error term, it's uh, quite I mean, accurate to determine extremal number as long as your graph is not bipartite. And what about the bipartite graph? So next time we will see some examples of bipartite graph that we, I mean, and we see some, I mean, known results about the extremal graph of some bipartite graph. In general, Determining the extremal number of bipartite graph is an extremely difficult problem. And we only know very little. And then we see some of the known things that we know. Okay, so then see you in the next video.